In the first Studio Inter of 2021, we'll be reviewing the matches against Crotone and Hellas Verona. We'll be previewing the games against Sampdoria and Roma, discussing Mercato rumors, Suning selling Inter, this week's Moji, Moratti and Frog, and much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter, only on centreinter.com. Benvenuti, bentornati, buon anno to the first Studio Inter of 2021. We hope you've all had a nice break over the holidays. We hope that you've had a, if you celebrate, uh, you've had a lovely Christmas. And if you don't celebrate, you've just had a break, then enjoy. I hope you had a relaxing holidays. Uh, and that uh, happy new year to everyone. And I hope we all hope that this year is infinitely better than the last one. Um, but uh, we're going to do our best to keep our hopes, uh, to, to keep the positivity going uh, here at Studio Inter uh, by discussing Inter every week with Mr. Positivity. Uh, welcome, Mr. Mohamed Nasa. Hola. <laughs> you eight in a row. You must be like. I don't know, is this like some sort of Mr. Positivity overdose or something? Like eight <laughs> wins in a row, six goals scored. Like, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> like you, it's been you, good, man. It's been good. It's, uh, <laughs> it's really, uh, it's been a good run. Um, and I, the, you know, we'll get into it later, but uh, I think it's not going to end anytime soon. So fingers mm-hmm. crossed. Let's see. And we're also joined by our good friend from Canada. He's a producer over on TSN, our own in house referee expert, Mr. Michael Gallo. Another win, but another week in second place for Inter. Mm, exactly. And we're also joined by our very good friend who has recently rejoined the writing team and editing staff over at Semperinter.com. Welcome back. Times two, Mr. William Beckman. Thank you. Let's hope my return to Inter is more successful than that of uh, Ivan Perisic or... Uh... <laughs> Anyone else who's rejoined into who I can't think off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, Raja, it's good to be back. Raja, Raja, no. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, we don't want another. You can't. Bia, bia, bia. Yeah, bia, bia, <laughs> Although I, I, I do want to see, I, I, I do want to see Will in a mohawk, um, okay. bleached in peroxide. <laughs> I want to see how that looks like. I think we all do. Well, I've um, got the time to experiment with hairstyles at the moment. But, uh, I've you got certainly time do. Spent at home for the next few weeks. I might as well. <laughs> exactly. It'll grow out quickly as well. You're young. Right, let's get to it. Um let's start with uh with with the um with the rumors that have been it's been quite a I mean the the, we, the the year is barely 4 days old when we're recording this, but already there's been quite a bit of controversy surrounding Inter. Uh the the one that Corriere dello Sport kind of started because if you look at how this kind of this whole thing started, it started when more and more Italian outlets started talking about how Suning and obviously the impositions put in place by the Chinese government on investment, foreign investment, as in investment outside of China, but above all, investment in football, because that's kind of been really detrimental to their own Chinese Super League. Um, several players leaving and they're putting a wage uh, like, like you have in, in the NHL and, and NBA and, and other sports in, in, in the U.S., uh, a ceiling for for I don't know the exact terminal terminology here. Maybe you can help me out, Mike. But like a, a ceiling for how much money you can pay, uh, how much you can how much money you can spend on wages. What what's the that code? would be called the salary cap? Salary cap. That's the word I'm looking for. And they they've got that now in the in the Chinese Super League, and many players are leaving uh, as a result of that. But it's not just in 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 China they've done that. They've done it generally on sports. They 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 don't want to spend money on that because obviously when you bring in big big name players. Who, who just sit there and hoard capital and then they leave the country. That money also leaves the country and the Chinese don't want to do that. That puts Suning in a, quite an awkward position because they're, not, they're no longer in a position where they can invest uh, in, in Inter the same way that they wanted to. And so naturally, uh, these rumors started uh, floating about Inter Suning wanting to bring in investors into the club. And our good, dear friend, Ivan Zazzaroni, uh, the director of Corriere dello Sport, decided to take this a whole step further. And it reported that Suning are one are looking have, are, are, have, want to sell their majority stake at Inter, and they're using uh, the Rothschild Group to to sell that. 
Now, the only problem with that is is that the Rothschild group does not represent Suning. The Goldman Goldman Sachs does. Um, and what they what, what what's actually happened is that they inter are looking assuming are looking for investors and they've sent out a brief via uh, Rothschild group to to investors to invest now whether or not that is to replace Lion Rock Capital or to to come in together with Ryan Lock, Lion Rock Capital is is, some, is is it remains to be seen and that's up for debate but I mean first of all. Uh, I want to. I want to hear what we, what you all think of this, and 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 starting with you, Mo. I mean, we all we know now for a fact that uh, Inter, as of today, uh, in Suning are not looking to sell Inter. Um, but looking further down the line, personally, I'm a little bit worried because unless this changes and unless the um, people are let into stadiums soon again, um, I think that it, this this is becoming a a, 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 um, a zero a sum this is becoming a, a calculation that doesn't add up um, because no money is coming into this club right now and with with and or any club uh, and 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 with with the impositions put in place uh, where, how do you what do you what do you think about this how do you view the situation how dangerous do you think this is that sooning leaves no, look, uh, <clears throat> I, I don't know how further into the future I can predict, but I, I can, like, from where I stand, I think there's two, two things worth considering. The first is it's very nice to see um, an ownership group that is uh, proactive in, uh, you know, trying to figure out ways around the current uh, difficulties, the current liquidity difficulties facing almost all football clubs around the world. And I think we're quite fortunate to have, you know, now looking back, have gone through the years of uh, uh, FFP because it really had forced the issue of uh, becoming a more professionally run club, uh, uh, you know, uh, less uh, profligate, uh, just uh, all in all a, a, a better machine. So I think the Inter of today is 100 times better uh, suited to face these extremely difficult circumstances than Moratti or to even to hear's enter, which was uh, a, a few steps ahead uh, ahead of Moratti's enter in, in terms of um, professional stature. So it's I, I think the fact that Suning are going out looking for investment is a good sign because to me it it uh, highlights the fact that this is a, a group that is aware of the current situation and is taking mitigating action uh, in the correct manner and at the correct in a timely manner as well. So that's one thing. The second thing is, you know, like you're talking about, uh, the, the, if, if fans don't get let back into the sport, etc. I think this is a cataclysmic event that's going to uh, fundamentally change the way every team. It's so it's not like Inter would be uh, alone in that uh, in in that boat. This would be a, a thing that changes the, the the entire face of how uh, the sport, or even sport, not only football, but sport in general. Uh, moves forward, so I, I, I think th that that doesn't worry me as much in the sense that it worries me very, very much that that sports might go away or, or sports as we know them might go away. But it doesn't worry me from an, an intercentric perspective. So, like you say, looking down into the future, we might see a, a situation where where Suning say, "Listen, guys, we're making a ton of money, but we can't take it out." out of China, uh, either we have to create an investment vehicle to uh, funnel that money through legally, but through a loophole or, or something something of the sorts, or uh, this uh, this ownership has become untenable and we need to find a way to, to, to for someone to come and carry the club forward. And, you know, it is what then it is what it is. It's, uh, you know, it's another transition. Mm. But uh, in the short to medium term, I think uh, we're in good, we're in good shape and we're in good hands. And I think yeah. that statement by Stephen Zhang was incredibly important because of the way it was, you know, he had to come out that strongly. And it was very important that the, the, the statement came directly from Stephen Zhang and, uh, you know, speaking for Su Ning, saying that, saying that this is completely false. We're not looking to sell the club um, because that kind of thing can quickly deteriorate, can quickly run out of hand. And, and 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 spin out of control. So I think that was a very important thing. I mean, if anything, they've been pretty, you know, Suning have been criticized for not maybe speaking out as often in the media as they probably should. 
some would say they're a little bit too passive, but here they didn't mess around. They they went for the jugular, and the statement was perfect. It was exactly how it was. It, it struck the right code, the tone. It struck everything. Everything that needed to be said was said to kind of clear any doubts. Um, but uh, you know, having said that, I mean, I I've said on this podcast to you and Will, you've both been here listening to me saying this that my biggest nightmare is coming to this and ending this season, missing the Champions League, which would force Suning to leave. That, although the statement has been said, this is that, that that nightmare has been brought to life even further. That, I mean, I've been really rattled by this because that would be disastrous. That, that would be doomsday scenario uh, because I, I don't see how Suning could continue um, with missing out on Champions League revenue. The few you know, the, the, one of the few um, funnels of revenue that still come into this club um, and has for the past two, three years. Um, but, I mean, if we look a little bit long term at it, Will, uh, what do you, I mean, what 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 risks do you see here um, with, with, given that, you know, the, Suning are a big brand name, although they're from China, uh, in, in terms of the Chinese government basically putting a stop to investment in football, that's going to have its ramifications. You know, we've seen with with Palotta and and Rocco Comiso and Italian American owners that they they have they you know they have other problems. Um, what what is your take on all of this, Will? Well, I think the problem we have here is that, as most said, it's basically impossible to predict more to you know beyond the end of the week at the moment in in life let alone in sport um, <laughs> the world is changing uh, every week and the financial outlook for the biggest companies around the world is changing every week so you know I, I find it very difficult to uh, get worried about any sort of specific scenario that may be around the corner in a few months time uh, certainly the the restrictions that the Chinese government are placing on their own league and on um, uh, businesses that are doing business outside of their country is a problem for Suning because it does certainly uh, force them to scale back their operations. And that, I believe, is what they're doing. That is why they're looking for um, these new sort of uh, sponsors to help them refinance these bonds that they've uh, that are expiring next year, um, worth 375 million uh, euros i think um that's why they're looking for new minority shareholders to come to come into inter and cover sort of the uh the general sort of liquidity needs of the club so there's clearly there is clearly some choppy waters ahead we know the we know the um the annual budget was or the, the annual sort of financial review was released recently and there was a minus 100 or or something to that effect um in terms of debt so the you know the, the outlook is not good there's no point pretending that we're in a happy position financially um but in terms of looking forward, I think the only thing we know for certain is that Suning don't really have any um, benefit. They don't really take any benefit from from looking to sell Inter now. You know, we know that they came into football not necessarily because they loved Inter, but because because they wanted to expand their brand in Europe. As far as I'm aware, and as far as what I've read, that's not something they've achieved yet. This is that's still very much an ongoing process. So to to pull the plug on Inter wouldn't make any sense from that point of view. You've also got the fact that you know Inter fundamentally isn't that big a part of their empire so to to pull the plug on into doesn't necessarily that wouldn't necessarily save their um uh, that wouldn't save their um their empire anyway if they were looking to sort of um to recoup some funds so i don't think even it would have that huge an impact so i think in that sense we can be certain that there's nothing sort of imminent um but yeah i mean th- there's clearly a there's clearly a possibility that if you, you know, even if inter do make the champions league this season which i personally think they will you know there's still there's certainly a possibility that in the next couple of years they're going to have to review their plans because everyone's reviewing their plans. Um, but you know, for now, I, I'm I'm happy to sort of stay now, na- sort of uh, navigate by the day and and trust that you know Sooning are not going to just pull the plug out of nowhere um, because at the moment uh, it doesn't really seem to be of a huge benefit for them. So like you, I was sort of um, reassured by the very sort of frank and dismissive tone with which they denied those. Uh, reports at the weekend describing them as baseless um and it was a very short statement as well wasn't it It was about two sentences so oh it was clearly it was, not yeah. taking any any crap in, in that no. sense um but yeah I, yeah there's a risk but I, i'm 
I don't see it as, as imminent from what I from what I've read and from what I've looked in, into today. There's no real reason that it would benefit Sooning right now. If if maybe the situation will change in a year, sure. But the whole world is going to change in a year. So oh, God, let's a year. Just, let's I can't just see what happens. I can't even think. By <laughs> two weeks, I had let alone an entire year. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, no. So yeah, that, that's that's a fair enough point. Um, but. Um, Mike, uh, I quickly want to let you sp- share your thoughts on on this um, on on the whole thing. I mean, Corriere dello Sport was completely ripped asunder, and and Zazzaroni, who is he's not doesn't have a great reputation because of some of some really really horrible things he's done. Uh, the, la- the the one that springs to mind is is the fact that he outed Sinisa Mihailovic, someone he's known for twenty years, as having leukemia when he specifically asked him not to do, which kind of tells you. Pretty much all you will need to know about that man, but I want to. I want to keep. I want to keep. I want to hear a little bit about your thoughts um, uh, on this whole thing before we move on. Well, quickly, what I'll just say is we don't want this. We don't want a sale to happen. Like that's that's bad mm. news. You know, Sooning has come in and spent a lot of money and done. You know, we complain. You know, five to ten years over the last between. I'd say between 2011, 2012 to like 2015, before before Suning bought Inter, we weren't really spending that much money. And then Suning came in and they started spending. That's what we wanted. You know, we've highest paid coach, highest paid manager. We spent so much money on bringing in guys like Lukaku. Um, it just if if Barella, was, yeah, yeah, but just I mean, just just name it one. Like we we do not want a sale to happen because. Mm. Suning has come in and invested a lot of money. 700 million euros, I saw. I mean, to me, Suning are the best thing to have happened to Inter since May 22nd, 2010. That's absolutely. My, absolutely. My absolutely. And, they, and they, you know, took a little bit, but they, once they, once they f- first started, you know, putting some money in, we, we, you know, start seeing a difference in the last few years. And we don't want a change of ownership. That's, that's for sure. If we have a change of ownership, I think we'll, ha- we'll definitely see a decline in on-field performance and that that will definitely happen so uh, we got to hope that there's no truth to this rumor i'm glad that you know soon put up a, sta- a brief but somewhat of a statement to say no this is not true let's hope that's not true because uh you know i i, I mean it's still possible that they could look for investors but still keep the team though right yeah so like, yeah that's i mean they have as long as they rock. keep like the majority that's uh, that's, yeah. that's the most important thing yeah, I mean that's what they did. I mean when they brought in Lion Rock Capital, that was basically a uh, the whole idea there was to bring them in so that you know they replaced Tohir and that they uh, they they were going to be the investment firm. Uh, and and I think that the most important thing right now is this new stadium has to happen. I don't care if it's round, squared, an octagon, if it has indoor cows, indoor trees. <laughs> this new stadium needs to be built ASAP. It's as simple as that. Because af- you know, uh, un- you know, be- after this is finished, after this whole thing is over, after because because it-, it can't go on for more than two years. No pandemic has gone on for longer than two years. Um, the, they people you you know the economy can't handle lockdowns for two years anyway but but what i'm saying is at some point you, there is going to be some sort of return to normal life and at that time you need to have this new stadium uh, and you need to start building it now so that you don't waste time now is the perfect time to start building it you know in one but do you think that there's p- potentially some complications with with stadium plans and maybe that could have <laughs> sparked these rumors well, I, I don't think there's I don't think there's a connection there at all. But I mean, you never it's Italy. You never really know. But I do think that. Um, but I do think that the fact that this is something that no one has re- answered. The Inter and Milan already have this. The, the you know they can already build in Sesto San Giovanni, which is kind of in Milan. They already have the permit to build, but they don't want to. Which I don't understand why they want to. They, have, they absolutely want to build at the San Siro. This gives them leverage against the Milan, Milan City Council. However, Milan City Council, well, from, from they, they, they kind of, you know, the mayor of Milan, Beppe, Beppe, yeah, Sala, said that, yeah, they have this leverage. He admitted that, that we can't, we have to make, you know, we have to negotiate a deal. Otherwise, they'll just leave the Sesto San Giovanni. Um, but then you have the people residents, the affluent residents surrounding San Siro, 
who don't who have created who have formed this committee and they refuse to live for five years having you know the having their skylines ruined and ruined and it's going to be sounds and messy and blah 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 uh, then that's that and then you have the other people who say that the san siro is part of the cultural heritage and they don't want it to tear down because of that to me i don't understand why you even go there just you have the permit to build in sesto san giovanni do it what are you waiting for I mean, who cares? Milan is a metropolitan huge city. It's not that hard to get there. Um, so for me, I, I don't understand what they're waiting for. I really don't. Uh, and I, at the end of the day, this is what annoyed me. I think it's going to happen anyway. They, they're going to be forced to build there. And they're doing it together. So to me, it's like, you know, just play hardball. Move, leave. And 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 but but clearly there are other aspects that we don't know about that they don't talk about as to why they continue to belabor belabor, belabor this point about San Siro San Siro San Siro, but we'll we'll have to wait and see why that is or how that is. Uh, let's uh, let's move on to to um, to the to the to the Hellas review to the Hellas and Crotone games, two games that could not have been more different. Um, not just because Hellas are great team and Crotone are an awful team but also because of how because of how fluid Inter were in terms of attack but the similarities were were there in terms of individual howlers from two players that are so way past it that we need a new word in the English language to describe how finished they are what Samir Handanovic did against Hellas Verona this was the, I have no more words anymore. I don't even get I don't even get upset. I don't even get angry. I just I just shrug my shoulder. This is what I've come to expect from him, and that makes me sad. Um, let's start with that game, Mo. You've been a critic of Handanovic, quite you know we for 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 the fact that he doesn't move, etc. But this is something else. What is going on? What was that? He did didn't he do did after lockdown? Didn't he do something similar against Sass- was it Sassuolo? Torino. Torino. Thank you. Torino Thank from you. The yeah, that's one. From the corner. This <laughs> yeah. is becoming too much of a too. This is happening too often. This is happening way, way too no, often. No, but it's howlers but, that you expect from not even against from Verona. It was it was comical against Verona. It was it was really comical. And the sad thing is, it came after what a string of two or three games in a row where he uh, he yeah. had pretty strong uh, shot stopping yeah. performances. I wouldn't say goalkeeping for performances because he's definitely not a complete modern goalkeeper but uh, he had decent sh- shot stopping performances so it was a bit sad but it was ridiculous what what really bothers me and 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 the same for um uh crotone's first goal is that his uh, instinctive reaction first first like immediate reaction is to you know look at uh, one of the players and like complain like someone wasn't doing their job and I get it, you know, the marking Arturo against... Arturo Vidal, what was that? Sure, what? sure, <laughs> of course. But but that was the quintessential Samir Handanovic, uh, you know, stuck on the wrong, wrong-footed and stuck on his pace and not not going for a ball where he was clearly tracking... I can't remember uh, the, the Crotone uh, uh, scorer's name. Uh, he was clear... You can see in the replay, the replay that, that's, that's got, that comes from uh, behind the behind the bench you can see his eyes tracking the 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 the, the player as he rises and, and makes contact with the ball and Handanovic just does not move and his first reaction is you know to wave his arms and complain and shout at this and and he he dared do the same uh to Skriniar in the Ellis game that, that that for me was was really ridic- ridiculous and the fact that Skriniar you know finally goes up and saves the day is is even um was even <laughs> more uh, you know uh, just, it was it, it was an immense performance by him, uh, and uh, yeah, like I mean, whatever you know, I, we can go on and on about Handanovic. And there's nothing not, you said at all, you know. Like he, he, the guy needs to go. The guy needs to go. It's, no, it's, uh, it's it's becoming. You know, I remember. I, I can't remember who it was who said that. I, I think it was it. If you if it was you or if it was Mike or even Will or who it was that said that that you know getting rid of Julio Cesar a few years early might have hurt, but maybe that, no, it was it was Mike Pilucci was I think who said that getting rid of uh, Julio Cesar a few years early to bring in Samir Handanovic might have been painful, but it was the right move to do. And so was so clearly that should have been done with Samir Handanovic last summer or the summer before that because this is getting, 
you know, he's he's bec- he's not only a liability. He he he's, he sends shock waves down the down the central defense. And and to me, Samir Handanovic is one of those. You know, through this through the darkest period of Inter's modern history, him and Icardi have been probably one of the only two shining lights who have saved this team time and time again. But what we're seeing now is it's not a it's not an unraveling. I don't even know how to explain this anymore. He is an absolute risk every time. And 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 it scares every every ball that is flown into the air, uh, that, that is flown into Inter's box. I have a I have a I have a heart attack. And and if I have it, then you can only think what the guys on the pitch who train with this guy and and have to clean up after this guy's mess think. And that that sends shock waves. Uh, and that's not a that's not a good place you want to be. Um, which is kind of also why I don't think Inter will win the scudetto. You need to have a goalkeeper that you can rely on to win the scudetto, and Inter don't. And, and and that's that's just a fact, and it's a sad fact because I, I I really like Samir Andanovic, but I mean if we if we go on, if we want if we move on to Mike, I want to hear Arturo Vidal. Uh, I was very critical this summer, saying that he was past it too, him and Kolarov. Now it seems that the scales have fallen from Antonio Conte's eyes as well, because he apparently lost his mind with Antonio with with Arturo Vidal screaming at him to STFU and w- play play the game instead after causing yet another insanely stupid penalty. After this, on top of the first goal, where he does this thing that he's been doing all season, which I don't understand why, and that's this thing where he just stops running in his tracks. He he doesn't slow down. It's as if you have a it's it's as if the batteries run out or if if the if you know the electric cord is pulled out he just stops dead dead in his tracks and that that's when they scored their first goal um we have arturo vidal for another 2 years two and a half years at 6 million euros net per season i i said i said it was a mistake are you are you ready to say that this was a mistake now or or are you do you still want to wait before you say it's a mistake bye bye arturo <laughs> see you later I cannot wait until Inter gets rid of Vidal. Um, what's with first? Of all, we mentioned about the the first goal where he's just standing there. What we, we mentioned, Handanovic ha- always acting like a statue sometimes in, in his slow reactions. That's what Vidal was doing on that play too. He had a cross come in to the goal area, and you've got one defender covering two attackers, and Vidal is standing there just watching it, and he's like just. His reaction is like, "Oh, what happened?" Like, no, it was your, <laughs> it was your man. That's where you should have been. And, this, and to see Vidal one. like not take any blame on that, and then the penalty. Like, Ugh. if there was just a little bit more force on that play, just a little bit more force, you could have mm-hmm. argued that that could have even been like a red card. What Vidal did, like the, the amount of force he used, wasn't enough. But he somehow avoided a yellow card in that play too. What the heck is he thinking? Like, both goals were his fault. Crotone scored two goals at Inter. Both were his fault. He deserved to come off at half. And the video of Conte telling him to STF, good for him. And I hope he doesn't (laughs) play the rest of the season because of it. Because he should not be on this team. As long as the the team is healthy and Sensi is, is, uh, you know, in that midfield, we've, we've, we've taken up another body in that midfield. We don't need to be playing Arturo Vidal because he's just going to cause some kind of mistake and it's going to screw us. Mm. And it could have sc- screwed us against Crotone, but I'm just, I'm, I, I've had enough. You know, if we would have done this maybe five years ago, we, we've been rumored to bring in Vidal for since mm. the Stone Age, and all of a sudden <laughs> we bring him in when he's past his prime. Too late. See you later. I don't care if he goes on a free train. Get him out on a well, that's the only way you can get that's the only yeah, way you can get rid of him. It, it's done. I, I do not want to see him. I get it that you know, Inter had a they wanted to have a mentality of having a lot of reserves, a lot of good bench players, and that's what he should be. I don't want him playing in matches where he's just coming up and causing problems. Mm. Like, had had Inter, you know, not store this could have e- easily been a draw or a loss. You just if they didn't, if Crotone did just didn't like suck like crap yesterday, yeah, if they were a little bit better. Mess. This could have easily been a, a draw or a loss against Crotone, and I'm just I I don't want to see Arturo Vidal play in any any more meaningful matches. If we're up three nothing with in the 80th minute, okay, but that's it. I don't want to see him play anymore. He's cost Inter at least two games in the Champions League on top of you know this this kind of nonsense we saw against Crotone. Will, where are you on the whole Arturo Vidal thing? Are you prepared to say that yeah, Conte was wrong and uh, we shouldn't have gotten him and he's past his peak, or do you still want to wait a little bit longer? 
Uh, well, I think I'll wait a little bit longer before saying it's a complete disaster. He, he has been a great player. He might remember how to be a great player in the next month or so. Um, the fact that we're playing fewer games means that maybe he won't be as as burnt out at his uh, slightly older age. So, you know, there's possible that he could sort himself out. Maybe Conte giving him a bit of a, a dressing down in public uh, or in, um, will help him to to screw his head back on. But yeah, obviously his uh, his performances so far this season have been uh, pretty disastrous. You know, I thought when he made those mistakes in the Champions League and um, in some other big matches that this would be a player that maybe couldn't be trusted in the biggest matches because he fired himself up too much and he was... Uh, sort of, he almost wanted it too much. But if he's giving penalties away against Crotone as well, then that theory doesn't really work. He's going to be a liability in every match, uh, if that's how he plays yesterday. So, um, yeah, thankfully it didn't cost into yesterday um, because Crotone kind of gave up after half time. Um, and you're right, you know, we've, we've conceded three goals in these two matches against Verona and Crotone, and they're basically all individual errors. Um, you know, so I think uh, that's at least one. If you want to flip it, you can say that we haven't given anyway any sort of uh, systematic goals like we were doing at the start of the season. Um, so that's at least one positive. But yes, Vidal himself is is a problem, um, and I think Conte has probably realised that himself. But you know, we should just remind everyone that um, we've won eight games in a row. Um, we've won these we'll two get, games, yeah. And you know, we've so far we've had a go at Handanov and had a go at Vidal, which is fair <laughs> enough. But but I have to say about Arturo Vidal. No, it's absolutely not bad, and we're going to get to that as well. But the thing is with Arturo Vidal, and this is the, you know this was the reason why I absolutely didn't want him in the summer, and I think, and, and him and Kolarov because Arturo Vidal especially when he was at his peak, he lived off of the frenzy, the intensity, the aggression, and the timing. When you get uh, when you get older, the timing gets wrong, which means that you just come off. When you when you but when you still have that frenzy and aggressive aggressiveness, you come off like a lunatic and you get sent off and you cause penalties. And this was a guy together with Kolarov who was supposed to bring in Porta Esperienza. They were supposed to bring experience and winning to the title. And you're in a situation now where both of them are at the fringes at this project, and they're two of the most high, of the highest paid players in this team. Uh, and together, when you add Christian Eriksen to that, that's almost 25, 30 million euros in wages that is wasting away on the bench. And two thirds of that can be blamed on Antonio Conte, for sure, because he insisted on these players. And that, that's, 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 that's a problem, uh, which, which I think will bite Inter in the butt. But having said that, Inter won against uh, Hellas Verona by playing a 3-4-2-1, something that I was uh, kind of, when we after the Torino game, what I wanted them to do back then. But he did it with Lautaro and Perisic behind Lukaku. Now, that experiment, um, Lautaro did better than expected. Perisic did not do that well at all. Perisic did um, as expected. Did as expected, exactly. Um, but, <laughs> Mo, um, I want to hear what you think here. Um, what do, do you want to Are you convinced by the experiment that I was ranting, raving on about, I was excited about a few weeks ago, or do you never want to see that again? No, I, I, I do. I, I think um, I think Perisic is a problem. I think Perisic is a. I think there's a a, a problem in the squad up front. It's that uh, there are three players, if we discount Pinamonti, who do roughly the same sort of thing. Uh, maybe Alexis is a, a little bit more uh, versatile in, in in his work outside the, the the box, and then you have Perisic, who's really in no man's land in a in a Conte system. Um, he, he's. I, I don't know where to play Perisic other than you know in in, in Spalletti's uh, Spalletti's module. I I can't see him. I can't see where Perisic can play. So I definitely like. I, I like the three four two one um, with with what it does up 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 front in certain in terms of like movement and dynamism and and so on and so forth. Like we've seen, you know. The interplay between, particularly the hold-up and, and interplay between Lukaku, Perisic, and then subsequently Lautaro on, on a couple of occasions, one of them leading to a goal, uh, uh, is, is fantastic. Um, but I just don't think up front we have the right people or we're, we're missing someone uh, the, the Perisic, uh, in the Perisic slot. And if we play Alexis, then you really have no one. You're playing your three strikers. 
uh, in one go if one gets injured one one gets uh, sent off if uh, one gets tired there's absolutely no room for rotation so uh, th- that, that's my only problem with with uh, with the module I, I really like Conte's boring, simple, flat three five two. I mean, I I, Thank I like you. I like that bread and butter uh, nature of it. I like the fact that it's very workmanlike uh, and it's very uh, you know uh, unflamboyant, and the players know what to do with it. And we have the right. We have not only do we have the right people for it, but we have the right backup for the right people for it as well. So. Uh, I, I think it's good. It's good to t- test out, especially in these games, to test out various modules: uh, three, four, two, one, uh, the three, four, three, the w- w- whatever. All these different different options, and it's good to have those those uh, tricks in your in your arsenal. But uh, I, I think the way the way we are going to win the scudetto is uh, primarily relying on the three, five, two. Well, if we, exactly. I mean, that's the way I look at it, too. I, I don't think Inter will win the Scudetto, but if they're going to finish in the top four, they have to do the 3-5-2 because the club... Because one thing that Conte has done, and I, I really want to praise him for this, is that he it took him twelve, it took him 15 months to understand that Milan Skriniar is not a sprinter uh, and that he does, that, and that neither is uh, Stefan de Frey and neither is Alessandro Bastoni. And so he has kind of shifted the balance of the team a little bit deeper, which allows the team not to get so narrow or, or too wide. And as such, they don't get into these difficult situations of having to make lateral movements backwards or, or, or laterally because they're not very quick at that. That's, that's, that's a balance issue that he's addressed by, by, by playing the team a little bit deeper in terms of balance. And that's finally, uh, wish he'd done that a year ago there. Cause I think Inter would, would have, would have picked up those points they lost because of it. And, and, and especially in the, in, in the Europa League final as well. I think they might even won that game, but anyway, it's no, no point in li- relitigating that, but at least he saw that now. However, and, and the midfield with Barella and Gagliardini and Brozovic and Stefano Sensi, that looks pretty good. But I do want to, I want to hear what you guys think about this. I think Matias Vecino has been injured for a long time and him being reintegrated into this squad, I think he does have a role to play in the 3-5-2 because he's a very dynamic player and we know that he comes up clutch and scores goals when Inter need them. I think he has a role to play and I think, to me, that's almost like a new signing. And and this isn't me trying to, you know, paint paint a brush of sunshine on, 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 you know, trying to, you know, hold up a turd and say that it's chocolate mousse. No, I genuinely think that Matias Vecino has a role to play in this 3-5-2. Uh, I'm keen to hear what you all think on that. Uh, start with you, uh, Mo. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking about Vecino the other day, especially when I was writing the preview because he's been back training at Tapiano and uh, training with the group, albeit still not ready for inclusion. Yeah, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, well, I, well, I guess we'll have to wait and see. It's funny because Gagliardini is, you know, uh, better than Vidal at the moment, which is, you know, shock, shock, horror. Um, can, 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 can Vecino then, w- what, what role will Vecino do if we have Brozovic, Barella, and we want Sensi to play? Or will he replace Sensi when we want to be a little bit more dynamic and defensively solid and then since he comes in and, and it unlocked matches in the last 30 40 minutes i don't know all i remember now from vecino is that the the good is great when he's good he's great and when he's poor he's very very poor he's uh, he's definitely much less disciplined uh, tactically than uh, gagliardini positionally and, and and so on and so forth but probably far more uh, technically gifted uh, he he used to carry the ball f- fairly well uh, and and find like you said you know a clutch player in in, in, in important games so like uh, D'Ambrosio he find himself in right in good positions so I don't know I the, the long this is a very long winded way of saying I, I I just don't know I think he definitely gives us an option and only time will tell but I'm very excited to see uh, if he if he does have a role to play because he's definitely not a downgrade on Gagliardini. Definitely not a downgrade from Vidal. So you know, at least he's that. <laughs> what about what about you, uh, uh, Mike? Do you do you think that Vecino can, you know, this suits this team tactically? It's been a long time since I've seen Vecino play, and per- perhaps I'm forgetting Vecino how he plays. But uh, look, I, I wanna I wanna see how he's come back from injury. 
And I do think there's a place for him in the squad on in the three five two starting lineup. I would say no, but I would I wanna see I wanna see him integrate it back into the squad a few games before I'm make, ready to make that decision. Um I like Vecino. I don't think he's great. I don't think he's bad. I think he's somewhere in the middle. And I think he's look, Vecino scored one of the most important goals for Inter in the last five years. And we thank him for that. And I I'd still I think it's worth giving him another shot and seeing what he what he's capable of doing. And I'd I'd like to see him in that three five two. Um and then kind of more more so make a better judgment once that happens as he's back from injury. Uh let's let's I, I'd give him a shot, but I would hold my judgment until uh until we see that oh will what about you yeah i agree i don't think he's got a place in the starting lineup unless there are injuries um i think he's certainly got a place in the squad though simply because you know conte wants players that are suited to his ideas that's why ericsson is being accompanied to the the exit door Vecino certainly does that he had uh, some space at the start of last season when he was fit um scored a couple of goals and yeah, I think in the one of the sort of the the outside midfield roles um, as a replacement for Barella or Gagliardini, I think he is he's certainly useful as an as a substitute. Anyway, I think one of the the um, problems we've had in the last couple of months is that Conte hasn't had any midfielders to bring off the bench, really, mm. um, which has often contributed to this sort of um, uh, this trouble that we've had in certainly in the Champions League when our first game plan ran out of steam and then we didn't have anything else to offer after that. So. Uh, it's definitely good to have uh, someone who can come off the bench and can can not be a disaster. Um, <laughs> but he, I, speaking I of positivity, <laughs> yeah, no, but he, I, I think Mike's right. I mean, I think he's probably scored our most important goal of the last decade since the yeah. Coppa Italia final. I mean, what would be more important than that goal against against Lazio? So yeah, I mean, he's certainly got his place in in his recent history. But I I, sh- I basically share these reservations about his physical condition. You know, I just I just looked while you were talking about when his last appearance was. And it was against Verona at the Bentegori, but it was the, the game we played there last year in July. And that was only yeah. 20 minutes. So to go back, I think I don't think he started since before the first lockdown in March. So, you know, this is a very, very long time away um, for somebody who had a, quite an annoying and worrying knee injury. So I certainly don't think he's going to be rushed back in. Oh, no. Um, oh, no. Conte is going to be very... So it's probably going to be another few weeks or so before we oh, see him. Oh, God. But, yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. by all means... Yeah, we've got him. If he if he is back to his best, then I'm sure he can be useful. And he, he's very See, good at popping up with a goal every so often. But so. not just that. It's, yeah. it's the fact that his movement, he's a very dynamic player. And I, I, he's got, and he's not, you know, he does a little bit what, without the aggression, I'd say, minus the aggression, but the movement and the running and the and the covering of spaces that he that Conte wants Artur Turo Vidal to do. Matias Vecino offers that. Now he doesn't. His passing is not that great, but uh, and he's not that that good of a tactor. And, and sometimes he's not the aggressive level that peak Vidal was. He doesn't have anywhere near that. But I do think that he can offer something to this Inter in a three-five-two, next to Brozovic, Barella, or Brozovic. Uh, or Barella Gagliardini, or, or one of the, do you know what I mean? Like one of those, like that extra role that's supposed to link up with movement and cover space between midfield and up front. I think he can, he can, he can, he has a role to play. But obviously, like you guys, all of you said, I mean, he hasn't played for almost six months. He had a serious knee injury or a knee operation, which will take time to recover from. Um, but but I do think that the, he could be like in, in maybe a couple of weeks' time, given allowed, uh, and the reports from Italy say that Conte is actually seriously considering reintegrating him properly into the project, which suggests to me that uh, that that I, I don't think it's just out of necessity because he does have Vidal there. But if but if he's understanding that Vidal was a mistake and that he's past his peak, I think Vecino could be very important for Inter. Right, um, we have some very exciting games coming up. Uh, not the one uh, against Sampdoria on Wednesday, because it's against uh, away against Ranieri's Sampdoria, another former Inter coach, who who has who is who, who knows how to completely frustrate teams. Uh, I watched I've watched quite a bit of Sampdoria this season, and they he's so good at frustrating and locking and and and, and closing games down. And this was one of those games where Romelu Lukaku would have been. He, you just got to have him. Unfortunately, given the muscle injury, it's not too serious, but I don't think they'll risk playing him because after this game, you have Roma on Sunday at 12.30, the lunch lunchtime kickoff. Um, but, I mean, let's start with the Sampdoria game. 
I cannot. I know. I I think the 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 winning run ends here. I see a draw. I see a nil nil or one one draw. Uh, I I don't see how Inter are going to win this game because simply because of how Ranieri knows how to lock down teams that are generally rather flamboyant. Let alone a team that sometimes struggles with 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 playing openly, uh, with creating chances and playing free flowing. Um, so I'm thinking one one draw here. Uh, where are you, Mo? Do you think it's going to be nine from nine? Yeah, I think uh, I think nine from nine is uh, where I'm at uh, at the moment. I think, uh, I mean, Sampdoria, Sampdoria are quite poor. Uh, like you say, their their best bet is uh, is frustration, and Inter have been prone to being frustrated earlier, especially in the season. Um, but I think I just think you know, of course, Lukaku is uh, Lukaku is sitting the game up, most probably. I hope so for his sake. Uh, he he will leave a big hole and up front, but I just think a lot a lot of things are clicking into place at the right time at the moment, with uh, Sensi back in full fitness, and we we like it's it's very difficult to say what Sensi does well, uh, you know, uh, but th- his impact on the side is almost mm. immediate. His his presence mm. is is really uncanny. I I I don't know what he does. Like I, if you ask me, you know. Brozovic, you know what Brozovic does. Uh, Gagliardini, I know exactly what Gagliardini does when he does it well, when he does it poorly. Hakimi, it's but what 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 quality Sensi brings into the side? I don't know because he's not he's he's not a trequartista. He's not he's uh, but he, he's transformative. You know his his vertical balls, his, his distribution, his uh, ability to pop up in the right places. He's yeah. So I think. Between Sanchez, Lautaro, Lautaro's form, you know, um, it's a super hat trick, hat trick, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, over the weekend, I, I think we'll be all right. And I think the quality will prevail at, at the end, you know, and we're not, we're not even playing Ericsson, you know. So I think over the 90 minutes, uh, you can't against, against the league's strongest, uh, uh, the league's strongest uh, attack say that I'm going to sit back and defend deep and hope. They don't catch me on a mistake, on an individual mistake or two. And if you open up and play football against Inter, it's just a matter of time before you, they, you get caught on the break. So I, I think it's, I, I think uh, Sampdoria are unfortunately for them, for their sake, uh, a couple of notches of quality below Inter at the moment, and it's going to be a uh, not a clean sheet, uh, not the clean sheet. <laughs> Stupidly predicting every we week, you know. We don't do that anymore. We don't. Yeah, do yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm yet to learn. You know, watch me write the preview and put it, uh, you know, a three nil or a two nil. <laughs> <laughs> Always, uh, but uh, so but yeah, it's probably nil? not. Yeah, two nil. Two, no, no. It's like in all honesty, it's not a clean sheet. So maybe a maybe a three one, uh, a standard good three one with Alexis Lautaro and hopefully um, Hakimi scoring as well. Uh, which he does. Uh, quite, yeah. Which he does quite a bit. Uh, Mike, do you share Mike's? Uh, do you share Mo's optimism that it's going to be nine in a row and that the goal machine that is Inter continues, or do you have your reservations a little bit like me and think that Ranieri is going to frustrate Inter? Well, I love to share anything that Mo is feeling, <laughs> but uh, let's let's dig into this a little little more though. I mean, L- Lukaku's injury. I mean, it's obviously it's terrible, but at the same time, I I feel a little bit better just going off of how Lautaro was in his last game and scoring three goals. Probably should have had a fourth, but it, you know that was obviously an own goal. But he was in on that one at least as well. So I feel a little bit better knowing that Lautaro is coming off one of his best games ever for Inter and that he's going to be the the leading man in this game. So uh, maybe that comes to a crashing halt and that's you know that just too much optimism but at least i feel a little bit better going into this game that he's going to be the the one up top now having said that um while inter has had this eight match winning streak i've also gone on a little winning streak as well i predicted the the streak of uh sorry the the score of the Cagliari game to be 3-1 inter and that was correct and then the the next game i predicted was 2-1 against verona because all you guys picked 1-1 because hellas was playing great so i decided to pick a 2-1 victory victory that was also correct yes so now so i'm going to continue now. that streak to three <laughs> straight wins 
and it will be another 2-1 victory for Inter against Sampdoria. And thus spoke Mystic Mike. Um, <laughs> Will, what, what about you? I don't think I don't think it counts if you got a correct prediction because only because you we'd already taken the prediction you were going for. You're kind of, <laughs> you're kind of ruining the mystery thing by saying that's your I fault. Have gone for this. Yeah, that's true. But really, it's, it's it's down to us that you're on a winning streak because we yeah. predicted. <laughs> you know, I, I no, I have actually got a clean sheet on my prediction. I feel a little bit sheepish now after you've had that discussion, but we did have a few clean sheets before. Um, before Christmas, so maybe Andanovic will, will have another of his better games. I've got one nil. Um, I, I'm kind of, kind of hoping that it will be a similar match as the one that Roma had on Sunday with Sam. They were frustrated for 70 minutes, and then Jeko scored a goal, and they won one nil. I, I take that. I don't think it's going to be a rout. It's certainly not going to be a six-two because Sam are not going to open up the way that Crotone did. Um, so you know, th- there'll certainly be fewer ch- chances for Lautaro in this match. Um, but if you're looking at good omens for, for matches without Lukaku, we had Sanchez and Lautaro up front for this exact match last year at uh, Genova. We won that 1-3-1. Sanchez got a couple of goals, or one of them and nearly another one, if I remember, before he got sent off. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that, I think that's a front two that can work together, assuming Sanchez is fit, obviously, because he didn't play against Cortona. If, he, if Perisic plays with Lautaro, then that's another story. But yeah, I think I think I think Nima's right. I think Ranieri will frustrate us. I think it will be tight, and I think we will have to just make sure that we don't make any silly mistakes. Because generally, um, I know we talked about a lot of the, these howlers um, that we've had in previous matches. Generally, we've won these matches in this this streak by being solid and not making stupid mistakes. Um, so. I think that's probably the key to winning this match. I hope that Alexis Sanchez will score if he plays. So I'd like him to see him score. Um, Sam, what, was, what, was I, what else was I going to say? Yeah, they've, they've lost um, They've lost four of their last six, Sam, but they've all been by one goal. So I'm going to go for another one goal win and I'll say one nil. But I do agree. This is this is uh, another another game, a bit like the Hellas match, where if you win it, it's a very good sign that you're on the right course to uh, to become champions. I do think this winning streak is coming to an end, but I think it's coming in the game after the one against Sampdoria. Well, that's interesting. I'm really, cause let's move on to that then, because I think that Inter will win against Roma simply because Roma are hollow defensively and Inter know how to take on teams that are hollow defensively. I think that Roma, I, I, I do have a lot of respect for Roma. I really, I, I like how they attack. I think I'll, they'll definitely score, but I think Inter are good enough to, to to create that many chances to bury Roma. And I think it's going to be one of those f- high-scoring, classic Inter-Roma games where um, where Inter win 4-2. 5-4. 5-4 or 5-3. That, yeah. one in, that one with Hodgson. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. The, that was away 4-5. But um, I'm, I'm thinking the one with Leonardo as well. I think it was 5-4 or, or four, was it 4-3. I count 5-3 or something. I, I'm, I'm thinking one of those classic Inter-Roma goal fests uh, where Inter come out on top. Uh, that's what I'm. That's that's what I'm feeling. Uh, what about you, Will? Do you is that what you're feeling as well, or do you do you think? I'm feeling goals. I'm feeling goals certainly because, as you said, Roma are very attractive going forward, and I suspect they'll catch us out on a couple of occasions. And you know, at the same time, Roma have been leaking goals in these big matches recently. They they conceded four to Atalanta, um, and they conceded four to Napoli as well, didn't they? So I certainly expect there to be goals. I, I'm thinking maybe another two all. We've had a couple of those recently, haven't we, against Roma, or at least we had one a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, if we get four points from these two matches, I'm not necessarily bothered which way it comes. Um, so we're, we're oh, absolutely overall not. predicting the same thing. I think that's a decent. Ah, the, the good uh, old uh, four point will. <laughs> will. <laughs> four point will. Four point week will. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The return. They, they are. They, they do have. They, they have struggled in these big matches, Roma. So you know, in theory, we should be able to continue that. But um, they really struggled. Um, I've been. Well, the Atalanta game was very strange, wasn't it? Because they were great mm-hmm. for an hour, and then they just completely disintegrated. So, mm-hmm. if we if we can do that again, I mean, we have got a great record in second halves this season. So maybe we can do that. So that kind of thing to them. I noticed that. You know, we've we've scored forty goals this season. Twenty seven have been in the second half. Hmm. Um, so, and in, of the last 29, 23 of those goals have come in the second half. So we're really sort of being a diesel at the moment. So maybe we can do something similar to to, uh, to what Atalanta did. I hope so. Anyway, I don't think Roma are necessarily a, a streetwise team, which is why I think they'll be they'll be fun. I just hope we score one more than them. 
No, I, for me, I, I think Inter, I'm expecting loads of goals like you as well. But for, for me, because I think Roma is one of the teams that are, that are going to challenge for the top four. And, and that's still where I'm looking. I think it's way too soon to talk about the Scudetto, uh, you know, realistically. And regardless of where I, where I predicted Inter to be, I, I still I still think it's way, way too soon. So so for me, it's, this is about keeping Roma at bay, one of the top four candidates, because the, the Inter just can't afford to, to, to fall out of out of that um but mo where are you uh, uh do you do you do you expect 10 in a row then is that is, is that what i'm hearing yeah, yeah i do i do i do and i totally uh totally see uh the game panning out like you uh like you uh, like you predicted or, or or said i think it's a big high scoring classic inter roma matches i think uh i have nightmares of uh you know uh the gaps between uh um, <laughs> Fry and uh, Skriniar and uh, De Fry and Bastoni being exploited, um, but uh, I think overall, uh, I mean, they, they, they've let in what I think uh, 23 goals. Roma, they're, they're mm. I think the, they're a bottom half uh, team. I think in terms of goals conceded, and you just you can't you can't come to the San Siro this year and uh, with that sort of uh, defensive uh, uh, lack of solidity and expect uh, to take home the three points. So uh, yeah, I think, and I think, like you said, uh, I think was it you or Will who just uh, just now had said that they lack a bit of uh, street wisdom. I think Fonseca is a bit of a you know he's a bit naive, maybe or naive maybe is not a good word, a bit too idealistic in the sense mm-hmm. that he wants to play this uh, attacking whatever football that everyone seems to be uh, really uh, you know excited <laughs> about these days. You know, I don't want to say uh, jizzing all over, but uh, you know they are. <laughs> Uh, I'm yeah. with you on that. You know that. <laughs> I think, you know, like it's 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 uh, water meets rock. You know, uh, boring old uh, tactical tactically sound football will prevail, and especially when coupled with an attacking, a scoring, a high scoring engine, it's it's quite impressive. So yeah, I reckon it's an entertaining high scoring game with uh, 10, 10 and ten for Inter. Wow, Mike, what about Great. you? So, so that's it's, that's a nil. nil. Ill draw then written all over it. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is it is it the Sunday ma- uh, lunchtime match? Yeah, it is. That's weird, is. isn't it? Wait, we've yeah. never played Roma at a lunchtime game no. before. I was no. going to say that. Strange no. scheduling. Two lunchtime games in a row. Yeah. Oh. Can we stop with these these lunchtime games? Like, do you guys know how know how much this? It's six thirty a.m. for you for me in the East Coast to watch yeah. these games. Well, I you were get up. you were lucky on Sunday. You only had to watch the second half yesterday. You got the good bit. You can, you can miss <laughs> exactly. it all and just come on for sentencing. I wa- I watched it on delay. I can't get up that early. That's that's way too. I just whenever I see the six thirty morning game for Inter on the schedule, I'm like, are you freaking kidding me again? We get this stupid early game. I hate it. I absolutely you need to hate blame it. blame Suning. It's for Chinese exposure, isn't it? Six thirty a.m. on a Sunday morning. Like, come on, I wouldn't get up for that either. I'll tell you that much. And but... Saturday night, I was I was working late till like one o'clock in the morning. So there's zero yeah. chance I'm getting up to watch it. Like I, I watched it uh, last night just because I, I can't I can't get up that early. And and every time I see the, the schedule, I'm just this is just a horror show. And I can't start complaining about Inter until later in the night. And everyone's like, "What's he talking about? Why is why is Gallo going crazy about Inter? It's like they played nine hours ago." <laughs> so, so where where what do you think is going to happen? Are you going to have something to complain about against Roma, or um, you think it's well, going to be ten is, in a uh, row? Uh, I think this like. I got to watch. I mean, this. What's funny about this is that, that Roma and Sam, Sampdoria just played each other on the weekend. So I just finished watching that game uh, this afternoon, mm. just to get a good sense of how, what. Uh, that's why I watched that game as well. Yeah, and, and just to see where it looks like it was. A, it was a sloppy game because it was like pouring rain in Rome, um, and you know, Checo scored a really nice goal to to win it for Roma. But like, I think that this will be the game that. Uh, that ends the winning streak and it'll be a two, two draw. Um, you know, looking at their statistics, it's just offensively and defensively Roma can get it done. Surprisingly Roma. I mean, they've been quietly, they're a quiet third place team. I don't think I've heard that much about Roma this year and to see them in, in third place. It, I was actually surprised to look at the standing and, and see them in third place. I thought they were more, you know, if I had to guess and without looking, I would have just said they were, probably fourth or fifth or even sixth and to see them in, in third place. And that's a, a surprise for me. So they've, they've been getting 
the results. But uh, I think this is the match where will that will stop Inter's winning streak. Uh, 2-2 draw will be uh, the weekend score. They, they should have a point more as well because... The... <laughs> They're one of their secretaries yeah. took one of their points off them. <laughs> yeah. Who, the, and, when they were playing against Hellas Verona, and then he yeah. so they, they he resigned. And, points for them yeah. yeah, and then he resigned and went to Hellas yeah. Verona. Did he actually go in the end? Yeah, he did. He went in the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My my friend over on the Italian football podcast, John Solano, was not amused. I was because John is hilarious when he's angry, but um, but but he was not amused. Um, right, uh, let's move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip out the piss out of and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the positivity, which we presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Mohamed Nasser. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent, and he surprises uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, qualities. Yeah, uh, look, uh, guys, uh, it's a very... Uh, a very tough week to pick something positive because of the uh, you know a, a lot of good things happening in the uh, interverse. I think um, I, I had said during the match, and you know, um, it's strange when uh, Lautaro has a hat trick or you know, like we say, potentially for a poker, uh, and yet my man of the match was uh, was uh, Lukaku. Mm, mine I think, too. Uh, Lukaku, yeah, Lukaku was is the Marathi of the week for just the performance that he put on. Uh, flawless. I mean, you know, an assist. Uh, what's the one that? What's the name of the one where it's a pre-assist or a, what's it called? The ice hockey assist. The second assist. We, we call yeah, it. the second assist. Whatever. The pre-assist. secondary assist. That's yeah, called. the secondary. Yeah. Yeah, secondary assist or pre-assist or whatever it's called. Um, and then his goal was just an absolute gem. You know, really the control, the turn, uh, the way, uh, the physicality, and then the the just the the quality on the finish itself absolutely absolutely phenomenal so i think uh in, in a match where uh lautaro get, quite rightly gets a lot of the the spotlight and and, and the plaudits for his hat trick i think my my marathi is uh this week this week's marathi is uh definitely uh, romilu lukaku can't argue with that. I mean, he he's been. It, uh, it's, it strikes me quite funny because I'm. And finally, it seems that the penny is dropped with the Premier League fans and journalists because they're they're all shocked. Wow, he's so good at linking up. Yeah, we've been seeing that for eighteen months. I'm so glad you noticed. Uh, beca- but it's like all the thing, all the things they've said about him was so untrue. At, at United, he's 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 strong in the air. He's he's physically strong. He's fast as hell. He's great at linking up. His first touch is not uh, atrocious. I mean, w- what are they on about, Will? He gave well. He gave a great interview, didn't he, to a Belgian magazine um, mm. earlier this. Um, I don't know when it was. It was sometime over the Christmas period. Anyway, he was talking about the exercises that Conte got him to do when he was he first arrived. And he said for three months at Inter, for the first three months, all Conte did was get me to train with my back to goal. Because he said, if you're going to be, if you become a good player with your back to goal, then you will be unstoppable. And so he just, for three months, he would have Renokia on him in training. <laughs> Renokia would, Conte told Renokia to go in hard on him. And if whenever Lukaku lost the ball, they had to start the exercise again. So all that sort of pivot play that we're seeing is down to Froggy, I have, you know. Mm. For, for a <laughs> tough time in, That's an in excellent training. segue because now it's <laughs> Time for the frog of the week, which will be presented by Mr. William Beckman. E clamoroso autogol di Ranocchia. Yeah, you'd think I'd planned that, but I really hadn't. It just came to me. But um, no, the, the frog of the week, um, I'm going to give it to Timo Werner of Chelsea because um, he's not having a good time in uh, in the Premier League. He's really, I can't remember how long it's been since he scored, but he's seems like he's missing a, a glorious chance every week at the moment. It's becoming a bit of a um, a bit of a laughing stock um, for, him, for the way he keeps missing these chances. But it kind of ramped up a notch on Sunday against Manchester City. Um, it was Chelsea with 3-0 down and he, he had, a, had a corner at the end of the game and he, uh, he, he couldn't even beat the corner flag. It was, he, his confidence had gone that far. He seemed to sort of, I don't know what happened really. He, I think he kicked the corner flag and the ball just sort of rolled uh, sort of really pathetically uh, a yard away and he ended up sort of tripping over the corner flag um, and this meant that on Monday, this Monday as we're recording, he actually became a meme which is when you know that things are are going wrong because um, incredibly Spartak Moscow have mocked him on their own TikTok account. So I know Stefan Osensi will be very interested to hear about what's going on in the world of 
TikTok. So I thought I'd bring it into our podcast. Um, the, <laughs> they um, they did this they did this video where they had a video of um, them I think scoring a goal from a corner, uh, and the caption was sort of you know this is how this is what normal teams do when they score from a corner, and then suddenly they cut to Timo Werner doing his. Uh, sort of silly corner and the, the, they changed the music as well i can't remember what the song was but they changed it from the proper version of the song to like a really strange tinny version to kind of make fun of this this poor man so i, I think um in absence of, of outstanding alternatives i'm going to give it to timo Werner for becoming a meme and for being mocked by um the not even the best team in russia on their social <laughs> media profiles my <laughs> Brilliant. Um, let's move on to something much more negative. Uh, this week's Modji, which we presented by Mr. Michael Gallo. Well, uh, Will had a pretty good transition from Mo, but I also had a good transition because he was going from Lukaku and the 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 topic of uh, the Premier League fans came up, and, mm. and Manchester United, and then I was like, "Perfect, I'm next. I'm going to bridge this perfectly into what I have as the Mudge of the week." And then Will snooped in and got the Frog of the Week transition. Well, I was a little mm. disappointed. <laughs> now I have to backtrack <laughs> to what Mo's uh, Mo's because we can switch it around in the edit. Don't worry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, listen, something's been bothering me the last couple weeks, and I have to get it off my chest. Okay. Please do. Oh, like, Manchester United fans, specifically on Twitter, have just been driving me nuts. It's like the world revolves around them, and anything that happens remotely good is like, everyone needs to see this. This is what just happened. And then you get every single major... Uh, major Twitter account is just oh just gargling over over everything that Bruno Fernandez done. He's like, oh he's the best player in Europe. Best he's scored all these penalties. Come on, give me a break. Like I know he's a good player, but they, they're like he's the best player in Europe. He's the best player in the world right now. Take take a step down, Manchester United fans. Take a step down. Relax. You've been <laughs> garbage for seven years since Ferguson left and you're still garbage now. Relax. You're not a Premier League contender. I have to deal with so many of my friends that I work with that are Manchester United fans and they're tagging me and stuff about some stupid statistic that Bruno Fernandes got about goals or assists or he's involved with all these goals. Relax. Just take a step back. You haven't won anything. Take it easy. I don't want to hear it because Manchester United is not an elite team right now. Give it some time. You might be there, but they are not right now. They got some garbage, lucky penalty last week against Villa, where I don't think that uh, they should have got. They shouldn't have gotten it. And then where Pogba scored the the winning penalty no. against Villa. I don't <laughs> think that penalty. they're a good team. I'm just sick of Manchester United Twitter. I know they've been dormant for the last seven years, and I like it that way. Let's go back to that. <laughs> I don't want to hear it anymore. Stop it. My tweet. Quiet down. My tweet of the week was that. Well, actually, it wasn't from tweet of the week. It was what it was somebody who, who retweeted it on Friday because it was relevant when they got that penalty. Somebody said, uh, "Manchester United have won a penalty now auto completes on my phone when I type the letter A," <laughs> <laughs> because it is every week. Every I think they have the most penalties in all of Europe of the last the last yeah. year by like a long shot too. Well, it's oh. certainly not Inter, is it? No, no, definitely not. <laughs> I'm just I'm sick of them. Just pipe down, United fans. Yeah. Mm. No, I I I, <laughs> I think Premier League fans generally that that applies to them generally. I think when they discover that when Paulo that Paulo Dybala is a good player, or when they discover that Nicolo Barella is a good player, and they seem to this kind of arrogance where they think that they're just going to get him as if <laughs> as if Inter are some sort of. Uh, never mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that I would like to extend that to generally Mr. Prem face, uh, who, <laughs> who who we have. Uh, generally, uh, Premier League fans, uh, they drive one insane. That was all we had time for this week. I'd like to thank you, Mo, Mr. Positivity, or I hope Mr. Ten in a row next week. Oh yeah, I like that, Ten and Mr. Ten in a row. That's nice. <laughs> thank you very much. It was a really cool show. And as always, uh, great to have you on and back again, Mr. Michael Gallo. 
Thank you for having me, guys. A pleasure to be with you. And not only, hopefully, 10 straight wins, but a draw between Milan and Juve on Sunday or on Wednesday. Mm, yeah, well, we'll see about that. I <laughs> I still think that you were gonna, you were will rather die than help Inter in any way, and <laughs> it's not gonna happen. But uh, Will, thank you so much, and welcome back to Semper Inter. And it was always a pleasure to, to to talk to you on the pod. Thank you. I'm gonna go and spend the rest of my evening trying to find out when the last time was that we won ten in a row because it was a very very long time ago. And I I'm think not very confident. I mean, ten in a row in the Serie A. I'm thinking Mancini's record run. Yeah, which is 17, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. that was 13, 14 years ago. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> six points and uh, a sort of 15-year-old record broken, please, for this week. Mm. Well, I mean, if Inter wins 17 games in a row, they're winning the Scudetto. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Oh, no, I just meant I just meant it, it, it would be the, the, the longest run in that time. Would oh, break okay, that okay. record. So. Oh, no, I, <laughs> 17. Yeah, yeah. I'll take 17 wins. I'm not, <laughs> I'll I'm take not that fussy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, I'm your host, Nima Tali Rutsari, uh, wishing you all a good week, six points, stay healthy, uh, and sempre e solo forza Inter.